And so let's let's read. We're, we've made it to the fifth chapter of Romans. So let's go there briefly. We got a special testimony towards the end. So I'm going to try to keep this a little briefer. We'll only take uh, five verses here this morning. So let's let's start at uh, Romans five and one through five. Therefore, having been justified by faith, and that's what we led up to what we've talked to today, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. Amen. That's as far as we're going to go. You see, when God saved you, when he saved me, uh, he isn't finished with you. Some people say, whew, I made it, I'm saved. At least I got that fire. It's really just the beginning. It's just the beginning. God isn't finished with you. He's uh, in first uh, or Philippians 1 6. It says, having confidence in this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he began a work in you, right? You're saved. And after that, he continues to work. And so that's something to always remember. He's going to complete the work he began. Uh, until the day of Christ Jesus. So the chapter begins with justified, therefore having been justified by faith. And up to this point, he first he said, made it very clear in the fourth chapter. And again, I, I say this, I wish everybody in the world could read Romans chapter four. It would save us a lot of the problems we have and people's wrong answers when you witness to them and they tell you how they're getting to heaven. Read Romans chapter four. So, and again, you find out there that it's not by works. You're not justified by even, as I gave that example of helping Hans buy that car, it's no longer a gift. It was 25 cents of worth uh, of self-effort, but it nullifies grace. When you add even one self, bit of self-effort to grace, you nullify grace. And so it's not by works. It's not by circumcision. It made a, that clear. And it wasn't by the law. And again, when he brought up that example of Abraham, Abraham was justified by faith before he even had a child. It was before the law came. It was before uh, circumcision. And Paul's making a good explanation of that. And so he spent the first three, really three and a half chapters talking about the need for justification, the need for it. And he talked on and dwelt on sin for a long time. And then he gets to Chapter four, and he mostly deals with the way of justification. How do we, how does it happen? How do we justify? And now by the time we get to chapter five, we find it says we're justified. And now that that's, the air's been cleared of how that happens, and it's by faith. Abraham simply went out to the stars one night when God told him, he says, look at the stars, Abraham, you're an old man. You can't have any children, but see those stars, your descendants are going to be just as numerous as those stars. And the sea, uh, as many as the sand of the sea. You know, and Abraham looked out there and says, I'm 100, you know, at that time he wasn't quite 100, but 90. And he looks up and says, mm, I believe you, God. I believe you. That was it. Trust. And so anytime you believe God when he speaks or anytime you believe his word, it's faith. You're putting, again, it's, it's putting confidence in this, in what he says. And again, anytime you read this Bible, people say that to me, why doesn't God speak to me? Why don't he? Every time you open this book, he speaks to you. I mean, sometimes I've heard him, and I believe one time in my life I heard him audibly. And it's, that's, thought is with me, and God's kept that word that he said, but here it is, here it is. It's here, and every morning when I open this book, God speaks to me. And it's an awesome thing to have this, isn't it? To have this book. And he says, now, I've cleared up the way, how to be justified. And so let's go on from there and, and just go through this. And now he's really going to do, deal with the fruits or the blessings or the benefits that we have from being justified. All right, so that's the key here today, the results of justification. What is it? The first thing you'll notice is that we have peace with God. Therefore, having been justified by faith, he's already clarified that, we have now peace with God. Number one, peace with God. 
I, I was an enemy of God, and he'll point that out later in this chapter. I was an enemy of God. <laughs> but I'm at, I'm, I made peace with him. Billy Graham wrote that track, Peace with God. You know, people in the world say that all the time. You've maybe seen interviews. If you had one wish in the world, what would it be? And people often have said, I want world peace. I want to see world peace. And usually it's when they're close to a conflict and, or a country that's having war, a civil war, which Macedonia is coming very close to war right now. You can pray for them as a country. But uh, uh, war, peace, peace in the world, they say, or peace in the home. I think it's a little more personal. But you know, above all of those things, we need peace with God. I can't expect any peace in the world. And there's going to always be full war. Uh, but we can expect it. Peace with God is, should be our main concern, isn't it? It should be your main concern that you're at peace with God. And these are the overflows, the benefits of being justified by faith. All of a sudden, in an instant, I am now at peace with God. We, we've got something good together. You see that with the life of Abraham, too. Peace with God. And how does it become ours? How does, this, how does this peace become ours? It says it's through our Lord Jesus Christ. And what he did, and it finished the last chapter by saying, he was delivered over for your offenses. He was raised for your justification, right? So there you have it. It was through our Lord Jesus Christ. Anything we have in Christ comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. Bruce did an excellent Bible study on 1 Corinthians 1 in the prison the other day, and how many times it says, in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, and he kept repeating that thought, through Christ Jesus our Lord. It, everything I have today is because of the cross of Christ and everything he has done for me. He's that mediator between us and God. And so by dying on the cross, by being delivered over for us, as the last verse of chapter 4 says, and by his being raised from the death, he did it all in order that this would be possible for you and me. You see how God cares about people? It's done for us. It's done for us that we might have now peace with God. And if you're not at peace with him right now, you're not on speaking terms. And, and I don't know if, you, if you're not sure you, what you are with God, I'd be guarantee you you're an enemy. Just read Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3. You'll find out where you stand with God if you're not sure. He makes it possible to have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on from there. The second thing that we have, we have peace with God. Number two, we have it uh, through whom we also have access by faith. Access. Access, some of the translators have put it, introduction, really. What they're saying about that is that, that it means an entrance to a king, like an entrance into the kingdom or to the king through the favor of another. It's through the favor. In other words, I didn't just, I can't just go to God on my own and have access just, be, just because I have peace with him. It, it, it has been made possible through the access, this access has been entrance uh, through the favor of another, through Jesus introducing me by faith again into the throne room of God. Really remember what it tells, come boldly to the throne of grace. We can actually come before God. I mean, Abraham, think of it. Abraham, when he was justified, he had access all of a sudden to God. Remember, salvation in the Old Testament was the same for Abraham as it is for you and me. By faith and faith alone. We've been covering that through Romans. Romans makes that so clear. And then, so I, I come in, and then Abraham was called what? The friend of God. Doesn't that, doesn't that, doesn't that do something for you? When you hear the God who made the heavens and the earth, we, call, we sing that song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Some guy in Germany, a real serious-faced guy all the time, used to say, Ah, oh, that's not biblical. That's not biblical. Jesus is your friend. Abraham was a friend of God. And he can be your friend. He is your friend. Isn't that neat? If you, you've had peace with God today, you ought to be happy. Number one, you're at peace with him. Number two, you have access to God the Father. Access and it's by grace. And that verse that says stuck with me, grace, 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 it's all the way. Even after I'm justified, I need the grace of God from day to day, brothers, sisters. And so now I'm in a friendly relationship with him. 
And it says in, in 1 Timothy, just in case you didn't know this, do you need me as a preacher? Do you need a priest? Do you need somebody to go between you and God? The answer is no. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's your mediator. And so he allows you access through him, access into the very presence of God. That make you want to pray. And I want to encourage you to come to prayer meeting. Uh, many of you come. Some I, Come after work. If you can spend five minutes there, come with your work clothes on. Just There's something special about getting together. I enjoy my times alone with God. And I enjoy my prayer times with the family. I really enjoy, too, the times we get together here on Wednesday nights. I just want to throw that out because I haven't said that in a long time, that if you if you can come for just a short time and you're tired and you say, I have no time limit. Well, the time limit, go home, go home, make sure you get to rest. But I just say, just come, come and pray. But there's one mediator between God and man. And he has granted us access into the grace in which we stand. And that's the grace that I stand right now. It's uh, that I was a former enemy, but not only have I been uh, forgiven, I've been spared the wrath of God. Remember, it starts out with the wrath of God against sin. And now he said, I've been spared from that. Um, I'm in a, a place, believe it or not, if you're saved today, you're in a place of high favor with God. I, I don't know, this morning I guess God laid that on my heart like, and I understood it like I haven't before. He just reminded me, I love you. I don't know about you, but there are times when I need to hear God say that again. We, we get to, we've heard it from when we were a kid, Jesus loved me, this I know. But you go through life, things happen. And I know it up here that he'll never leave me or forsake me. But tough times he takes you through something and just to hear him say, I love you. It's special. I guess that's why I'm so thrilled this morning. Tears of happiness because I'm, I, I'm at peace with God today. I have access to the Father. and I st The atmosphere I live in is grace. And you know what? It doesn't depend on my uh, performance up here. It's still grace. And you know it's not a periodic approach. God grants us access sometimes. Aren't you glad you can pray when you on your in your car? You have access. I mean, think of the priest who entered into the Holy of Holy once a year. And it was the high priest. And he went in with fear and trembling. And now the curtain, when Jesus died, the curtain and the veil in the temple has been ripped from top to bottom. I mean, God did it. It was from top to all the way down to man. He says, it's open now through the blood of Christ. It's open and you have access. But how often we, it's the last thing we do is go to God. It's the last thing we do and it ought to be the first. And so he's made this a way available. And it is a thrill you've been justified. These things are yours today. Don't think, well, I hope so then you're calling God a liar because he said today, you have peace with him, you have access by grace into this grace in which we stand. And it's a permanent access to. And then number three, another thing or another thing we do is rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We can boast or rejoice in the wonder of your salvation. You just stop and sing, think sometimes and thank God for saving you. That's why I love that song. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Remember when the disciples came back and they cast out demons and they were all excited telling Jesus about it. Jesus said, and it's good to rejoice about that. And if God does something through you and, and demons leave, praise God. But he just kept this before the disciples. He said this. He said, rejoice rather. Not stop rejoicing that. There is, there's a lot of joy. I bet Mary Magdalene was happy. <laughs> when those seven demons left her too. And if, if it was the disciples who would have cast them out, they'd have been excited. Though they were excited about this. And then Jesus said, rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You know, there's times you ought to just sit down and meditate on that. And not only do I have a passport to heaven, not only do I have my citizenship is in heaven, but <laughs> I have access there now. And I look forward to the day when I... This body, if should Jesus tarry, because he might come back in my lifetime, and then I'm going to be delayed my 
rising to meet the rest in the air. I guess the dead are going to rise first to meet the Lord in the air, but it's going to be wonderful. You ever think about that? You ever think what heaven's going to be like? People are so unsure. And let me tell you, people, here's where you find the truth. People have lots of opinions. There's lots of religions out there. But God left us his word, and he calls it his word, the Bible. That we can know for sure of these things. And the hope, again, let me say the hope of the glory of God. We use that word hope, but in the Bible it's different than the way we use it in English in our day. And we use it. If I told you, hey, we're going to go to Geo, uh, or I got ice cream afterwards for everybody if, if it doesn't melt and something, you say, well, I hope so, I hope so. But there's a chance that it might not be so. That's not the hope when he talks about that. It's a certainty in the Bible. In fact, do you know the second coming of Jesus Christ is called the blessed hope in Titus? It's called the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? You imagine if it, we translated that word to what we think it is in English, you, how we use it? The blessed maybe? Refer to Jesus' return as the blessed maybe? This is all right. He is coming back. And it's called the hope and it's something that we can sure it's a certainty. And this is what we have in Christ, the certainty of salvation. The glory of God. Someday I'm going to see God in all of his glory. There are times on this earth that he gives us glimpses of his glory. He may do a miracle. He may change a life. In the glory of God, you see it. You see it. But not in its full blaze. And someday when I get a body that can handle it, I'm going to see him in all of his glory. And we're going to share in that glory, the Bible says. And so it's something to look forward to. So we have peace with God that deals with the past because our sins are forgiven. What do I have in the future? What do I have in the present? Times? I have access right now at this very moment to God. Just before coming up, I was talking to him. I have access. Access by grace. And not only that, God takes care of the future because I have something to look forward to that certain day. And that's to see the glory of God someday in full, full bloom. And you ought to rejoice in those things. But for the unbeliever, it's the opposite. Did you know the Bible says there's no peace for the wicked? no peace you're not justified if you don't believe in Christ you're condemned you don't have access into this great grace and Ephesians 2 11 and 12 says that unsaved people are without hope and without God in this world so today you stand to other it's very simple God made it you're either justified you're right with him right now or you're not and what he's trying to tell you, if you're not today, by the end of this day or before this day ends and before even in this minute or while I'm speaking, your heart can be right with God. Not me. That's what he wants. And for you that are already at peace with God, I think you'd say, I love you this morning. I love you. I have at peace. We have at peace with each other. Not that he won't discipline us. He will discipline us. But praise God for the peace we have. And now it just, it gets better. You want to hear the next part? This is the part we don't like to read. And if we had our Bibles and could kind of look over these verses, we would. But look at the next part in verse 3. And not only that, those are all good things. Not only that, but we glory or rejoice in tribulation. We rejoice in tribulations. Uh, even though we're declared righteous, even though I have access to God the Father, I'm still going to have troubles in my life. Did you know that? It's a false gospel that tells people, hey, come to Jesus so you can solve all your problems and you'll never have adversity in the rest of your life. I've heard people preach it. So I know it's out there, but it's false. You come to Jesus, maybe you're going to have more problems than you've ever had in your life. But I'll tell you this, you can go through it like nobody who's justified can do it. You go through it how? Rejoicing. Rejoicing in tribulation. The word for tribulation here is pressure. Pressure, squeezing. You ever been under pressure? The squeezing of the grapes to get the wine out. You know, otherwise you're not going to get that grape juice. You're not going to get olive oil unless you press it. And it seems to me God is saying with our lives, he'll allow us to go through things to bring out some fragrance from your life. To bring out something beautiful. And it's the only way he's going to make you a strong saint, isn't he? By tribulations and trials and pressures. But you know what? In the midst of it, maybe you're in the midst of a pressures right now. And I tell you this and be assured of it, that God is over all. It didn't take God by surprise. God is over it. 
You're going to know as a Christian, you're going to know conflict. Let me just tell you that right now. If you're a Christian, if you're justified, you're going to have conflicts. And God came to make us holy, didn't he? Be holy for I am holy. We'd all like to wish he'd said, be happy. <laughs> they said, be holy. And he does that work and he performs it in our life. And what did Jesus tell the disciples? He told them, he said, in this world you will have tribulations. So it's a guarantee. It's a guarantee. But the difference, the difference is if you've been justified in those trials, in those pressures, you can rejoice. Paul warned his new converts. And I think we better start doing that here. <laughs> so warned his converts. He said to them, you must go through many hardships to enter into the kingdom of God. Must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. That way we're prepared, right? Yeah, you know, I, I wish I'd have told that to this girl who got Elinka, who got saved in Macedonia, would come to our house. She gave her life to Christ, and then we didn't see her all of a sudden for two weeks, and we wondered why. It was because when she came to Christ, it was such an embarrassment to her family that her brother beat her with a club and put her in the hospital. She came out of it, though, trusting him. Trusting in this world, you will have tribulation. You give your life to Christ, but you can also find rejoicing in it. And I brought this book. Sarah was here, what, a couple months ago, is it? Does that time goes by? Sarah Lula was tortured in China in prison, and she spoke from this very place. And what a testimony. Were you here? Did you hear that? The movie. I just want to read a couple parts of her book. Just, uh, just a brief section here. This is the beginning of one chapter. She writes this. Now the day of graduate. Oops. Yeah, the day of graduation had come. She went to a Bible school. Okay, it's not a Bible school like you have necessarily, like we have in our country. Because uh, if you go and it's on Fourth Street, if it's the if it's on Fourth Street, it's going to always be there. Fourth Street. Every day you'll go to Fourth Street and you'll go there for Bible school, right? Well, in China at this time, it wasn't that way. Now the day of graduation was come because we were the first graduating class for ceremonies, and I'm in the wrong chapter. Um, oh, no, no, that's right. I, I was in the wrong, reading the wrong line. Here we go. After escaping three police raids, that's how she starts off the chapter. After escaping three police raids and locating our seminary four times, it started out on 4th Street. Then because of persecution and police raids, they had to move it to 2nd Street, 3rd Street, and 1st Street. Her seminary moved around. Imagine that's almost unfathomable to us. But then it says this, we learn not only the Bible, but ways to be prepared for flight and hardship. Did she need that? Yes, she did. In the atmosphere that they lived, Giving your life to Christ. And their father gave her the ultimatum. All right. To her and her mother when her mother was saved. And she might have shared some of this with us here. They gave her the ultimatum when they came home. She says, choose me or Jesus. And when they sold Jesus, he said, get out of this house. And for a time, they couldn't live in their own house. But listen to what she says. But the, uh, our seminary moved four times. We learned not only the Bible, but also ways to be prepared for flight and hardship. We were very close Okay, then I want to move over here to another chapter and just read this very, very short chapter. And again, she starts out, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, Acts 14, 22. So she's quoting a Bible verse, and then she starts, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me, was our evangelist constant reminder. So that's what the evangelist, their teacher, constantly reminded of this verse, you're going to in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, you're going to go through many hardships. In the early days of my conversion, this verse was a relentless theme. For us new believers, it was a common knowledge that something bad would happen to us if we chose to live for Jesus. Having the certainty of hardships ahead helped us brace for what was to come. No one was taken by surprise when troubles actually came upon us. The terror effect was diminished, but not eliminated. To be told that hardships were coming helped. You see that? It helped. To see sisters and brothers arrested was always a grave concern. 
but accepted because no other earthly recourse was available to us in either court or society. But being arrested, as you will learn, has its own sets of fears to overcome. In those early days, I made up my mind that I wanted to carry the cross like Jesus did. Even though it would be hard, I nevertheless desired to walk as he, as he did. There was no doubt about following Jesus to the ends of the earth. The evangelist would also remind us that wherever the preaching of the gospel would take us, he would be there. Jesus would be there. God would be there. Hardships, yes. His presence, yes and amen. Yes and amen. And you know what? She gave us a copy of this book when she was here, and she wrote just something in the front cover. And all she writes and quotes here is, God is so good. No bitter resentment. No bitter resentment. Some of you met her. You didn't seem like an angry person, did you? And she explained how God brought her through. But see, we have to understand these trials come. But, you know, why could Paul? Paul's not writing some high theology here. Oh, you should rejoice and didn't practice himself. We've been going through the kids in Sunday school through Acts. And we got through last week uh, on the, or a couple weeks maybe it was now, uh, Paul and Silas in jail. What did they do? Can any of you kids remember? What did Paul and Silas do in jail? They mope and cry. What happened? They were singing, I heard somebody say. Yeah, and when they threw him in jail, what did they do? Cry? What did they do? Sing? And pray? Did they pray too? Yeah, those two things. Wow, they were beaten up, and that's what they did. So Paul's not just putting out these words. He's, he's saying, I, I found this true. I can actually rejoice when I'm under pressure. Okay, but how? how? How can we rejoice under pressure? I, this verse gives us the key, doesn't it? Look at this. Look what it says now in verse 3, the second part. Knowing, see, it's the knowing. This is the part that makes it bearable. Knowing that their tribulations produce perseverance. In other words, God knows it's happening, and I know that it's going to produce something in me that can come no other way. God has to pressure me, put me under pressure, and under this pressure, you'll be... And out of it is meant to teach us something. And in this case, he says, uh, suffering actually can re, uh, produce something. Else. But did you know you can react to these things differently? Uh, sometimes I don't react very well to tribulations. And it depends on our attitude in those tribulations. Yes, you're justified. Uh, you can go through your trial and not rejoice. The kind of God, but that's not God's purpose in it. God's purpose in it is to is to bring you out as gold tried in the fire, more precious. But we can go resentful at the trials. We can resign to get discouraged and give up, uh, or we can resolve like like Sarah did here. She resolved, Lord, I'll follow you to the ends of the earth if it need be. And we know what it cost her. It cost her dearly. But you know, faith is shown more in conflict and in endurance than in any other way. Your faith will shine brighter than if we're all having a good time just singing together, praising the Lord and just rejoicing. And that's good. And we need those times too. But I'm just saying your faith is going to grow and it's going to shine brighter through those hard times. When Sarah was standing here, you could see faith. She trusted God through thick and thin. And faith is not receiving from God the things you want nearly, merely so much, nearly so much as it is accepting from God the things he gives. How, how many of you have life turned out like you expected when you were younger? Do you have views of what your life was going to be like that turned out a little different? Bob and I were just briefly talking about that this morning. But see, it's more, more than just getting things. From God, it's it's accepting from God the things that He gives, and no amount of suffering. This is a good part. No amount of suffering can separate us from the love of Christ. We have to wait till Romans eight to get there, but no amount of suffering can separate you. And yet, some people think because I'm God going through this hard time, God doesn't love me. Oh, but see how wrong that is. After you read this, it's it's made to create endurance within us, a patience. Some of your versions will say 
but it's being able to un- endure under trials and so on. Then verse four, and perseverance, character. Some of your versions will say experience, uh, but that's what comes out of it is your experience. God, God is taking you through the fire and it's character that's been proven. Some of your version, I think this is the best, proven character. Character that's been under the test of fire and comes out approved. You know, like the stamp of approval on, on a product that's made. It gets a stamp. It's been tested and comes out. And that's what God's doing with you. He's testing you. In a minute, we'll just see he's testing your faith. He's making you mature. You know what? There's no such thing as instant maturity, is there, in a Christian walk? You know, in a baby, in the natural, it doesn't happen. You know, it isn't one Sunday, Michelle brings Xavier here. We all saw baby Xavier, right? And then the next week, she brings him. He's running up and down the aisles here. Doesn't happen that fast. It, maturity takes time to build, and God takes his time working in us. He takes Moses out of Egypt and spends 40 years working on him, taking the prince out of him so he can make him into a, a humble servant and lead his people out of Egypt. It took 40, 40 years of education with God to make him what he was. And if you want to hold your place here, just go to James real quick. I'll just read it. James 1. And Memorize this to James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings are scattered abroad because of the persecution. And the first thing he says in the later is, is my brethren, count it all joy. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, different kinds. They're going to be different for you, different for Hans, different for John, different for uh, Laureate, different for every one of us. They're going to be different, but they're going to be trials. So, so he says, count it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing, again, here's, here's how you can do that. Now that we've read this, you know, knowing that the testing of your faith, what's faith again? Our trust in God. God's going to take you through circumstances. You're going to have to say, God, I trust you. God, I, can't, I don't know if I can trust you. The disciples did it. Jesus said, well, where's your faith? Other times he said, oh, you have little faith. We brought them through things, difficulties, storms in their life. And just to test her faith. And so James says the same thing, knowing, and he'd been through some of these things, knowing that the testing of your faith produces something. He produces patience. Say the same thing Paul said. It produces patience. But then he says this, but let patience have its perfect work. Allow it to. See, there's something in your life where you have to say, yes, God. Remember the Soteris gave that to us when they preached here for two weeks straight? Yes, Lord, they gave us. And that's always a good reminder, and I love seeing it up here, because that should be our answer to everything God tells us. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And so if God sends a trial your way and he's testing your faith, say, yes, Lord. Allow, allow patience to have its perfect work. You notice he calls it perfect work? There must be some. Others lie, and I believe them. It's perfect work. Allow it to have its perfect work, that you may be complete. Perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I mean, that you might be mature, that you grow up, you come out. If I, see, James is saying the same thing as Paul. This is what we have in Christ. We can rejoice in tribulation. Because why? And knowing that it produces within me patience. And the times I bucket and I, I grip my teeth and I don't like this. And I get all angry. It's almost like it's in vain for me. I go through something, and, but, and if I allow it, and I sit down for a moment and say, oh, Lord, you're trying to teach me something. Forgive me. You ever done that? Rush through a day, something happens, gets in your way, and you realize, oh, Lord, forgive me. I, I, I didn't even recognize it might have been your hand, so I've saved me from an accident. Slow, I mean, we've heard all kinds of stories. But God is good, isn't he? He's looking out for us, but he's going to test us, and we'll come out. Good. Dave always used the explanation of the three Hebrew children in the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, bend his toe. Anyway, he comes out, they come out, and it says that they didn't even have the smell of smoke on them. I sometimes go through a trial and I stink. But I like to come out of the fire dry, better for it. Where I can look back and, and I can see my faith is growing. I'm trusting God through a time. I could have never trusted him early in my walk. He didn't. He knew I couldn't handle it. You know the disciple, the Israelites had to, God had to take them a different way because He knew that they would have too much fear going a certain way. And so God knows those things. But if He takes you through things now, you can handle that you couldn't with His help, obviously. 
and his work in your life. And so he brings you through it. And I forgot what I was going to say. But anyway, uh, here's a poem from Robert uh, Brown Hamilton. It's just a short. It was a 19th century poem. He said this. I like this. Listen to this closely. I walked a mile with pleasure. Got that in your mind? I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. Let me read it one more time. I walked a mile with pleasure. She chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and not a word she said, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. I think that explains it quite well. And not only do, do patience builds or care, uh, proven character, you're mature in Christ, you grow up in the things of God. He says another thing. He says the, the last thing here is, and character produces hope. Hope. Again, this is the hope uh, of our salvation, the, the hope, a certainty of a hope that God uses like solid insur- uh, assurance. And so that produces within us. And see, God building us into things. We should be building that hope. So we're more sure about things as we go along. We're more sure about heaven. We're more sure about everything, the promises of God, and growing in our faith. And then verse 5 says, Now hope does not disappoint. Some of your versions will say, Make us ashamed. God's hope and this hope, you'll never be disappointed. In the end, when you reach them, nobody's going to say to heaven, oh, is this what I get? <laughs> is this it, what all I waited for? You know, it's kind of like we talked up, we talked something up. We love flan. When we were kids going, you know what flan is? It's kind of a Mexican dessert. Oh, it's great stuff. And Shelly, by the way, you owe me one. <laughs> anyway, uh, I just remembered. Uh, so this flan, we, we, we were at a wrestling tournament. We couldn't eat. We had, we had to starve ourselves, make weight and all that stuff. So we had a two-day tournament. And afterwards, our friend were inviting to their house in Minneapolis. And we were going to have flan. And all we were talking it up with all our buddies. And there's some who were going to come with us after we visit these people. And we get there, and we loved it. That was just my favorite thing at that time. So we get to the house, and she made some flan. It was beautiful. We started eating that flan. And this girl that came along with us, Marcella Harstead, takes a bite of it. She takes a bite and said, you guys have been talking. Is this all it is? I thought this was going to be something really great. I guarantee you when we get to heaven, nobody's going to taste heaven and say a little bit and say, oh, is this all it is? In fact, you know what? Len Ravenhill used to say this. He said, if God would just open the windows of heaven a quarter inch, just so you could see a quarter inch, you'd never backslide again. They explained how glorious it's going to be. Enter into the joy of the Lord. It's going to be joy. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. And if there are tears, they're going to be wiped away. Isn't that something? What we have, this glorious hope to look forward to. If you're justified, that's promise. But you're going to learn that hope more and more. You're going to have more confidence in it and grow in your faith. And it won't make you ashamed. Why? It says because here, and the verse answers its own question, but we're not really finished today, but I'm going to try to cut it short. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. My, there's somebody we sang... Today, a song about the sanctuary. I'm a living sanctuary. And in me dwells the Holy Spirit of God. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're a sanctuary. Did you know for God? Think of that. Is that that awesome? That God lives in you? You're his temple? I don't belong to myself. The Holy Spirit lives within me. And he's going to make sure that I'm not disappointed. He's pouring out the love of God. Not not my love for God, but God's love for me. He pours that out in my heart by the Holy Spirit. He's given to us. Do I deserve the Holy Spirit? No. Again, I say grace. Grace. And God just let me know this morning when I early this morning woke me up to spend some time with me. Thank you. I love you. I, I just can't put it into words. But it makes me confidence in this. And, and what's the Holy Spirit say later on? He bears witness with our spirits that I am a child of God. 
Romans chapter 8. We haven't gotten there yet. Sorry, I kind of give you sneak peeks in there. But he also does that within my heart. He bears witness and tells me, and God told me this morning, Dan, you're my child. You're a child of mine. And if you're justified here today, you're a child of God. That ought to thrill you. To know that you're at peace with God. You have access. You can talk to him anytime. That you can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And yes, you're going to go through hardships. And kids, you're going to go through hard times. But trust God through those hard times. Allow that, that patience to work in your life. You're going to be patient. You'll never get it like the woman who prayed, God, give me patience and give me it now. Indirectly, you're asking for trouble. <laughs> I used to hear Mary Babcock play, Lord, give me patience. I thought, <laughs> But she, she meant it from her heart. And I'm sure God did. We do need patience. And that song says, if I never had a tr- tr- trouble, if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that he could solve it. I wouldn't know what faith in God could do. And then the verse of the song goes, through it all. Through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. Amen. And God, good. And this is what he's given us here this morning. These are some of just some of the benefits we have being justified by faith. And we ought to be the happiest crew around. Rejoicing even in the midst of tribulation. All of grace again. I'm worthy of none of these benefits. Every one of them I list, I'm not worthy of them. But they come to you and to me as benefits of his grace. And of being justified. And have another testimony of that we'll hear now from Bob Hatfield. So, Bob, I'm going to pray and pray for you. And Father, we just thank you for your word here today. And I just pray that you would strengthen us in our faith and in our walk with you. God, hardship is a part of our life, and you want to put those pressures on that you might develop Christ's likeness in us, that we might become more and more conformed to the image of your Son. Do that in my life. Thank you, Lord, for the fact today that you actually love me. Even as we sang in that one song, you know my deepest, the deepest things in my heart. And yet you love me the same. I don't understand. But Lord, it's grace from beginning to end. And I praise you and I pray you would sanctify me. Sanctify us. Build us up. Mature us in the things of God. And bless Bob, Brother Bob, as he shares his testimony right now. In Jesus' name, bless him, Lord. And may we all have ears to hear what you continue to say. Amen.